Bonjour, everybody. If it's Wednesday, it's Warhammer. That must mean it's time for another episode of Warhammer Weekly. Yes, slightly different introduction because I'm on the road. Specifically, I'm in Paris this week. Uh, that's what you see. It's the Eiffel Tower. It's right behind me. It's the picture. It's not exactly out my window, so we're not in a movie. But here we are, nonetheless. I assure you, that is where this hotel room is located. Uh, hopefully, the internet will be good. Thumbs up. Tom, am I coming through okay so far? Uh, you are coming through great. Um, I am also somewhat displaced from my normal location given our unusual hour. Um, and so Vince and I decided to go with the the reds and purples button-up shirt today. Exactly. It's synchronized outfits day here on Warhammer right. Weekly. Yeah, so absolutely. Just to preempt those comments. Uh, you know, absolutely. they're coming down the line. <laughs> We're just going to nip them off the butt. Exactly. Done. We called before. We made sure we were wearing the same shirts. We matched our outfits. It was adorable. Thank you. All right. So, uh, you know, we're going to talk today what we're going to talk about for the feature segment. And this will be a tighter show than usual uh, because it is late here and I have a flight early in the morning. Uh, but uh, the what we're going to talk about today is we've seen a lot of rumors spoiled of 40K 8th edition. And there's been, obviously, there's a lot of rules that look very similar to AOS. But there are a lot of little changes, and I've seen a lot of discussion that has gone around uh, throughout the throughout the interwebs, the wonderful series of tubes that uh, you know that some people want to see these things in AOS. So we're going to talk about whether or not we think that's feasible. Should they be imported into AOS? Is that good? Is that bad? What are the consequences of it? What would it mean? It has to change. All of that stuff we're going to talk about today. But of course, first, Vince is going to be our Vince today is going to be our grognard. Um, yes, <laughs> that's true. I'll probably play that role. I'll be Mister Stick in the Mud today, and Tom can be like Mister Gung Ho for change. It'll be a nice role reversal. Yeah, it'll be fun. Um, so for today, we um, let's start with our rumor image because that dropped, and it's a thing. Uh, we have a thing. And um, I've heard people say, like, it's a new Lord Relictor kit. It's an elf thing. It's a Nefrata undead thing. It's a thing. What do you think, Vince? Well, so there are three. I think this boils down to three main guesses, right? I think yep. I guess you, could, you could boil this all down to three main guesses. One, there's the it spikes, so it must be Stormcast line <laughs> of argument, right? Which, let me just say, strong shot there. Like, if history is anything to go by with our multitude of releases, yeah, it's a pretty good shot. Yeah, I mean, I can't argue with that logic. That being said, I, I will say this doesn't look like any of the spikes we've seen so far. It's much tighter. It's not very Halo-like. It's more mm -hmm. crown-like. Um, and, and we haven't seen any of the spikes with like the gems in Stormcast, right? Um, yeah. so the second guess is the death because people have made connections to the crown, uh, to a couple different crowns, the undead wear specifically like the, um, the white King has a crown that looks something like this in its pointiness, right? And, sure. uh, undead can sometimes have gems. That's fine. Uh, but, and then if, but that's, I would call also the dark horse of this, the third possibility and perhaps the strongest one in my mind is the elf guess. Um, elves are well known for crowny like things that they wear, these sorts of spiky crowns. You go I back mean, to tons of different princes and nobles have spiky crowns somewhat like this. Let's be um, honest. And gems. The negative space is a heart. Yeah, well, an excellent. I point. don't see I don't see like Nefrata running around with hearts on her outfit a whole bunch. Um, That's I a mean, very fair point. I don't know. I mean, the mega space may that may be inconsequential, but it is a heart. Um, so I don't know. It might be Elfie. Uh, somebody pointed out that this kind of looks like uh, Teclas's neck thing. Um, maybe. Yep. Maybe. Uh, that I'm going to be really sad if it is. Um, because I don't have any money right now. Um, <laughs> and in fact, the first round of shipments, uh, I'm, I'm excited to get home today because my first round of shipments arrived according to FedEx. And, uh, nice. and my, uh, my nanny said it's a very large box. 
Um, You'll be swimming in, in KO when you get home. Yeah, exactly. Just just neck deep in KO boxes. Sure. Uh, no, I mean, in the end, I'm going to come down on on Elf. I really will. Um, we we've seen a ton of Elf spoilers. It's clear that the Elf and Death contingents both really want something, and so we'll see <laughs> that in whatever's released. <laughs> it could be. It could be like. A dwarven rune, and they're like, "Oh, I think it's the new elves. I think it could be the face, the armor for the elves." Yeah, it could be like the face of a new Morkanot from 40k, like have sure. last guns on it and look like the face of Mork, and people would be like, "I don't know, man. Could be a death release, you know? Just like that, they'll, they'll find the way." So that being said, though, I, I would say this does feel like elf. Agreed, agreed. Um, but that makes my wallet sad. Um. Well, we've known it's coming for a while. Like, the rumors have been yeah, persistent I, and I'm regular. I'm saying if it's high elves. Let me say that. I'm saying if this is high elves in my wallet, is sad. If sure. this is dark elves, like the, the sea elves, I'm like, meh. Sure. Like, I think I wait. can, yeah, I can wait. Sure. So, um, other stuff that's going on. There's not a lot. Uh, the Warhammer skirmish uh, is, uh, Ben Johnson posted a link and said that they're going to be demoing the Warhammer skirmish on um, May 17th, May 18th, that Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday, May, come on calendar, why are you so slow? May 17th. Yes, 17th. And actually, uh, the creator of Hinterlands is going to be his opponent on Warhammer TV, interestingly enough. I don't know that's a connection itself with... Uh, with Hinterlands, because he had previously said this is unrelated to Hinterlands. So, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, how is that not something? I don't think that ca- you can read that as not something. Like, right, well, but, like, he came out and was publicly, like, when they announced Skirmish, he's like, I don't know any, like, I don't know anything of what's going on, and this is not related to my project at all. Which is fine. That just means it's not related to Hinterlands. That doesn't mean that yes. they didn't talk to this guy about whatever they made, right? Yeah, or yeah, yeah, yeah. or say, you had good ideas, look at this thing too, right? Like, that he hasn't been involved in some way. He said it doesn't have anything sure. to do with his previous project. Sure. I don't think he said, I don't think Bottle anywhere said that he didn't have anything, that he didn't have any exposure to it. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, I, th- I think what I remember him saying from TGA was that he didn't know about this. or so- It was something along those lines where it did sure. seem like there was a degree of ignorance to it. Sure. Um, but, I mean, it is what it is. Uh, what I would say is that um, I'm excited for it. Vince and I, for many of you, many of you know that Vince and I created uh, a Mordheim um, uh, port of the game. And we, uh, we love, like, uh, skirmish campaign play. And so I'm really hoping that uh, that they knock this one out of the park. Which I mean, we at this point, like, we have no reason to think that they wouldn't knock it out of the park. Um, right. But uh, you know, I'm I'm obviously I'm rooting for them because it's it is uh, it is play that is near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm actually I've become increasingly convinced that um, a lot of people are thinking like, are we getting a box set? And oh, by the way, Ben said that he was like taking questions. Um, and he's going to answer as many as he can on the stream on for the game, and I so I immediately like thirty. I saw your your deluge yes. of tweets, yes. just like questions. Like thirty seven seconds after he posts that, I I asked like five questions, and he was like, eh, <laughs> "Like the post, thanks, Ben." Um, and so uh, I'm becoming increasingly convinced. Even though I my first question was, "Is this coming with a box set? Is this going to have its own release?" I actually suspect now. The more I think about it, I think this is going to be part of the GHB two. Yeah. This timing puts us two months out probably from the GHB2 that they're going to demo this, which is about when we found out match play was coming. And uh, they introduced match play in the first GHB2. It would make sense that, that while when updating the match play for this, they have another kind of pr- like release that's going to entice people to GHB2, which is this new skirmish yep. system. Yep. Yep. Um, and it would make sense. I could even see them using the, like a single chart that have like one common for like composition stuff maybe for the skirmish and one column for match play if they are divided at all. Like it, because you, I'm assuming you might have to have points per model or whatever that looks like, assuming they, they move towards like a, a simpler uh, kind of sim- system. So I don't know. I don't know what that looks like, but. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what it looks like as far as like creating your, your quote unquote war bands, but I agree with you yes. that this would be the perfect thing to put in GHB too. Like, this yep. could be a section in there just like they did map campaigns and just like they did other things like that, right? It's well, then they did the call to, like, was it not called a war? The, whatever, the Path to Glory, like, there were rules for a bunch of different forces in there. Exactly. This could be an expansion of Path to Glory. 
a development of that with match play, and it could easily sit in narrative play. Like this could be sure. easily be one of their developments of narrative play where they're saying like, tell a story that your campaign, here are the tools for like, like moving in between games and how like heroes level up or whatever that looks like, gaining items, all of those things. Uh, a bunch of baked in scenarios for skirmish play. Like it seems like a lot of this would just write itself. Um, yeah, and, and let's just be very clear and set this up now that next Wednesday, since after they're previewing it and I'll be back uh in the states next wednesday like it's we're gonna be talking about this like crazy I it's mean, not next okay. wednesday it's two it's wednesday. 17. 17. it's, it's 17 is, next wednesday. is it Today a week is the 10th wow. i am an idiot um next week we'll be talking about this in yes. detail yes okay. so our show next week aos skirmish there um, you go that's what we're gonna talk about um other news uh, uh, NashCon uh, events coming up. NashCon on June second. The Global Narrative Event Coalescence on June tenth. Uh, check them out. There's websites for both. We'll have the links below. Vince, do you want to talk about TMS? Yeah, I do. Uh, I really, really do. So uh, just today, uh, TMS Tabletop Miniature Solutions, who did a, a previous Indiegogo campaign for uh, for a Undying Dynasties uh, army and for uh, the um, Kingdom of Equitaine, or Cretonia, however you want to call it, doesn't really matter. Um, they did both of those. Those are both successful projects. I got a bunch of the Undying Dynasties. I really enjoyed them. I thought they were great. I have a full review of the Dread Sphinx. If you want to see it on my channel, it's an awesome mini. Highly recommend it. Uh, stands in for like a Necrosphinx type of thing. Uh, the, they just today launched their Kickstarter for um, a vampire army. So wet undead versus dry undead, I suppose, is the way to look at it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what you can see is some of the uh, various uh, art pieces that are there. If you go to the campaign, um, you, so if you, like, it's live right now today. So I'll include the link down below. You can go check it out. You can see all the, all the art for the various models. Um, it has some awesome pledge levels. Mm -hmm. Like, you get a fig, you get the... Um, like the necromancer or the, is the necromancer fig, yeah, I think it is. Um, you get like the base vampire or necromancer, whatever it is. If you pledge for a dollar, one dollar, you get a which, fig, which is awesome. Like that's it's a great, crazy, yeah. yeah. Um, and then you know the rest of the pledges going up are very reasonable. And what I can say is a lot of it he doesn't have. He doesn't have like three D renders or whatever of a lot of it. It's just you know the art um, of what a lot of the things will look like. This is actually on Kickstarter not Indiegogo, so it's legitimately on Kickstarter this time. Um, I have no doubt he'll he'll make his goal. Um, you know, he's been very successful with the previous campaigns. Uh, and a lot of his art looks crazy good. And what I'll say is in both of the previous two campaigns, the art and the final figures have been pretty darn identical. Mm. Okay. Um, if you go back and look at the art of the Dread Sphinx back on the Indiegogo, the final model basically looks exactly like what was in the art. So it's it, like he, he, the art and goes to the sculpt, goes to the final product in a very one-to-one -one fashion. Um, and he's got some really, really cool takes on like the Coven Throne and uh, the Mortis Engine. His freaking Zombie Dragon uh, remake, I am honestly super excited for. It looks crazy awesome. Um, so... You know, not that I not that I don't like the zombie dragon or terror guys. I think they're good models, but it looks truly out of the park. Um, so go check that out. The link is down there. The pledge levels are fantastic. They're very fair. Um, as to you get a ton of product for really not that much. Uh, and the awesome thing about this is whether you're a ninth age player or an AOS player or something else in between, playing kings or whatever, um, you get to choose either square or round bases. Uh, with your order. So there you go. No matter what game you're playing, these figs will work for you. And uh, it's a silly little thing, but their bases are super cool. TMS does like these pre-magnetized textured bases that are actually really nice. They're heavy. They they sit into larger movement trays really nicely. Like I honestly really, really love their bases because they're like a super stable base. Are they selling them separate? 
Uh, they did for the previous two. Yeah, you could get them separate. I'm, I'm sure you probably still can. I think right now probably it's only the squares. I think if you go to their website, you can get just the squares separate. I don't think they have the rounds available separate right now. But I will have. But I will openly say I'm not sure about that. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll throw up the link to their website as well, so you can go look at the previous stuff that they've made. Um, but I'll, so I'll link the Kickstarter and their site. Um, Arthur's an awesome guy. He makes great stuff. This is. A guy with a passion for making awesome miniatures, support him. This is a member of the community doing great work. Like, this is what we want to see. So, check it out. All right, there you go. That's my pitch for TMS. We'll talk about it more as the campaign evolves. We'll watch it. Yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I don't have any money. As I said, I spent all my money <laughs> on my KOs. Um, but, uh, yep. Yeah, I'm going to be I'll, back. I'll, I'm backing I'll at the level at least to grab right. a monster or two. Yeah, sure. Like, sure. that's just automatic. I love their sculpts too much for the monsters. And you know I have an obsession with giant death monsters. Like, I yep. sell it. Yeah. Yep. I, I do own nine sphinxes, so. <laughs> this is true. Yeah. Yep. 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 What's, so, what's one more? There you yeah, go. All right. right. Exactly. So we, uh, let's move. Uh, you're not hobbying at all because you're traveling. <laughs> Yeah, it's killing me, too. I'm going to be on the road every day until next Tuesday. Like, literally, I'll get back home basically next Wednesday show. So I will have no hobby for, like, a week and a half, which is just it's unacceptable in every single way. Um, and uh, so it's killing me. I got pretty close to finishing up that that diorama, mm -hmm. that Sigmar for the diorama. I'm actually... I, I, I did some new stuff I'm very happy with. We'll see when it comes out. There you go. Obviously, I don't have anything to show. It's all sitting at home, many thousands of miles away from me and across an ocean. But uh, but I'm uh, I'm hoping to be able to finish it up next weekend, uh, and we'll, we'll see how it comes out. Uh, my wife was traveling for the most of this last week, so I got no hobbying done. Like, sure, because you, you had four kids as your hobby this last yeah, week. Yeah, no, exactly. Four kids and a bunch of Legos. That was my <laughs> hobby. I built an airship, a Lego airship. Does that count? Um, kind of, right? Uh, sure. So, uh, but I have a huge box at home, a huge box, and I am so excited. Um, I don't. I want. I need to finish painting the unit I'm currently working on, but I have mm -hmm. so much stuff that I want to like dig into and build and and all that. And so, yeah. Are you going? Well, first of all, just burn through this unit. But here's yeah. the question. Are you building everything and then painting, no. or are you going box at a time? I'm going to go box at a time because I want to use Good it as man. incentive to, to paint. Um, That's the way to go. Keeps you motivated. Keeps that paint on the minis. Yeah, box at a time is the way to go. Yeah, and and the reason, the only thing that's going to be the hiccup is I'm reconsidering my list. Of course, I am for Nashcon, um, sure. and which may have me painting at least one more Nurgle model at least. So. Um, I don't think I can point paint another like 70 plague bearers in the next couple of weeks. So I'm probably just going to switch to one or two more models. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see. Um, uh, man, those sky fire lists, I'm telling you anyways. Sure. Yeah. The, the question is, are you going to put together is a ship first up on your list to put together and paint? The answer has to be yes. No, Get rid not. of all your other ideas. No. Get out of ship. No. Do it. No, do I'm going to do, uh, when I finish these 10, um, uh, when I finish these 10 Arcanaut, I think I'm going to swap to 10 Thunderers. I'm going to do my, I'm going to do my big cannon Thunderers. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, I'll, then I might switch to the, the frigate, the mid-size ship as my, gotcha. as my next project after that. Otherwise, what I'll do is I might, if I don't do my Thunderers, I may go to a hero, like my an Admiral first, um, and then go to, because I want to alternate between, like, units and units of, like, 10 and um, ships, like, ships or single models. Sure. So we'll see. We'll see. Um, I have a set, like, painting, like, list, though, that I'm going to be moving through as well, because I, obviously, I'm painting uh, with, um, with future events in mind as well. So Right. So yeah. so what's your uh, so what's your pick of the week this week? I've still got a pick. Doesn't matter that I'm on the road. What what's your pick this week, Tom? What do you want to share with everybody? Uh, I don't have anything to share. You are a terrible person. You see I how that is? I I haven't had five minutes of free time, but I, I have a video that I definitely want to share. Well, uh, tell us about this video, Vince. I want to share Mr. Reef Beast Man 
Old Reefy. He recently did a video talking about dipping a toe in the water, coming back in the hobby. It was sort of a long ramble about what he went through, obviously, with, um, you know, there's a tragedy that happened a little more than a year ago. Um, but he's, he's, the healing process is, is ongoing. And uh, I think part of the catharsis was helping and doing a video. And so he put out another one yesterday called The First Steps Back. Uh, it's a nice hour and a half. So plenty of background to, uh, to get out your paints and do some good work on and listen to our old pal Reef uh, sort of wax about the hobby and his re-entrance into it. Uh, Reef was obviously a big, uh, a big inspiration to me. I discovered talking about Warhammer on YouTube through Reef. Many years ago, uh, I, he was the, my entrance into this entire world. Um, so I owe him a great debt of gratitude. And he is one of just the best people in the world, uh, a super nice guy. And I'm happy to see him uh, even putting any kind of toe back in the water. So I'll link his video. Go there, watch it, support him. Tell him you're excited for him to come back and you hope he's doing well. Wish him all the best. Man's had a, a rough road, but uh, I'm very happy to see him coming back. He, he is and will always be my hero. So there you go. That's my pick. That's a good pick. Uh, much better than my zero pick. So sure. welcome. If you're watching this reef, welcome back. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So that's okay. We can jump straight into the feature now. So let's talk about, Tom, you, I know you. We, we paired a list, and by we, I mean you. Yep. That's true. Um, I, yeah, me. Oh, no, 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 stop. We are going to go back because I have to celebrate every single victory that I have. Sure, um, go ahead. And uh, that victory is in the form, I'll make it quick and painless, of this. <laughs> sure. So right. just last week we had the image maybe. Was it last week or was it two weeks ago? It was, either, I don't know. It was in the last two weeks. Let's just say that. Yeah, I think it was two weeks ago probably. We had the image, and I was like, you know what? This is a Moon Clan Blood Bowl team, a Goblin Blood Bowl team. I was right. Called it. I straight called it. Yep, and it's actually from Forge World, which is what's really crazy about it, right? Because um, previously they hadn't spoiled anything Forge World on there. Like, we had seen some that were in resin, but they were all the Master Casts, not actual Forge World yeah. um, models. So the world has opened up. Now it could be any, now everything that is a rumor engine can be any crazy thing. Could so we know even anything. less. Yeah. 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 Awesome. All right. So now that we're done celebrating your minor victory, yeah. are we, uh, are we ready to, to talk about the feature and yeah. talk about, so as I mentioned at the top of the show, we've had a lot of spoilers for eighth edition, 40K. And obviously there's a lot of inspiration drawn from Age of Sigmar. I think that's, fairly obvious. My favorite thing is reading in the internet for people who had played 40k but never played AOS and like not realizing these are rules and then seeing people who do play AOS come in and comment. The interaction of those two groups makes me smile. Um, it, and everybody, it has indeed made me giggle watching yeah. the 40k. <laughs> like sure. suddenly get woke to this I guess right. Um, that being said, the, most of the interactions I've seen have been very positive, which is good. Everybody's friendly. We're all going to play in the same, you know, in a similar pool now. Yep. Um, but so as these rules have come out, obviously, they're not exact. It's not a straight port by any stretch of the imagination. No, and it's, there's a difference in with, the size of the rule book. Right. Yes. The, the alleged rules has been, uh, you know, 12-ish pages, mm -hmm. right? Um, so... Whether or not that's, we'll see what that actually turns out. But the point being is that there's been differences. And we're going to stay away from conjecture, right? So if it hasn't been directly spoiled, Aww. I know, but we're gonna, this isn't a tinfoil hat episode. Well, I mean, we're going to get into conjecture about whether or not we think this stuff should go into Age of Sigmar or is going to end up. I just mean we're not going to conjecture about 40K specifically. Sure. We're going to restrict our tinfoil hatting only to talking about should these changes be ported into AOS? What are the effects of that? What's good about it? What's bad about it? Do we think it's going to happen? That kind of thing. Okay? Yeah. Um, because there have been a lot of advocates I've seen that have been all about this. And certain changes have been, they've been very excited about bringing in certain changes. Well, and let and, me uh, just say, like, 
so we had talked about the general's handbook coming down the pipeline. And I had pointed out in a previous show that we technically don't have the AOS rules in the current Karadran Overlord book. And I, I had posted right. a conjecture that maybe we have an update coming. Like maybe the big announcement originally before we knew Ace. Like we, everybody knew it was Ace, so we didn't think the big announcement was Ace. I, one of my conjectures was that we'll have a rules update for AOS. We, there's, there's a possibility that we could see like a AOS advanced play or something like that in the general's handbook. Like, sure. like that is like, that is fully within the realm of, of possibility. They are all about multiple ways to play the game. Well, and it could also just be a point release too, right? That yep. alters some of the assumptions of the core four rules. Like it doesn't have to be any kind of like major shift. It could like, it could literally be AOS X.1 or something in, in, in sort of its explanation, right? Yep. And it's just an evolution and a refinement of the rules. We've seen them change war scrolls. We've seen them, you know, all that kind of stuff. They've changed all the subcomponents, right? Those have been rolling fixes. There's no reason this couldn't as well, because then it would just update in the app. And yes, the little, your little class, you know, your little card would be out of date, but okay. You know what I mean? Like it's going to be in the GHB2 and every other new book that gets published after this you know, it'll get included again. So I, I don't think it's beyond the pale to, to assume that some of these could become core rule changes, right? Yeah, no, exactly. And so, we, again, we could have core rule update. Like, any of this is possible. Um, and so I wouldn't write any of that out just yet, is what I would say. So what we're going to do as we go through this is we're going to actually look at by phase. And so the changes that are happening within certain phases of the AOS game. I felt like out of any of the possible ways that we could organize kind of our, our tackling of this. Um, obviously, there are aesthetic changes uh, to the profiles. Um, some of those, all, like, for example, the for monster charts, uh, you know, for them, it's just the big units, big monster stuff. Um, instead of having, like, the, the scaling chart down below, it's on the end, it's tacked onto the end of the profile itself. So there's some neat aesthetic changes and stuff like that to their profiles. Uh, but it seems like there is going to be a lot of overlap, all things considered. So let's talk about the hero phase, or what we okay. call the hero phase for in AOS. Right. Um, yep. And so one of the things that sits in here is magic. Obviously, there's not magic in, in 40K, but you have your psychers and the activating of them. And so what we've had revealed there is that um, they there's a mastery value that's associated with each caster. Um, I'm going to call the Psychers casters. Um, and this mastery value determines the number of casts that they get per turn and how many are per round and how many unbinds that they get per round. Um, yep. Those unbinds are going to be out to 24 inches, which is an extension of six inches from the current AOS rule set. Yep. And each faction has their own lore, which I thought was interesting, as well as like the equivalent uh, seemed of Arcane Bolt. So there's no Mystic Shield equivalent by default, but there was an arcane bolt and then uh, an entire lore per kind of faction. Yeah, um, everybody had smite, I think, is what the basement is. Yeah, they called it smite, exactly. Uh, also, there were a critical failures uh, chart, so like you could melt your brains out with a bad cast. Yep. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So so let me... I, I kind of want to take these in turn, Yeah. Right? Yeah, go ahead. All right, so the 24-inch thing is the first one. Yep. Um, that seems like one of those things that's a necessity for 40k, but doesn't need to come over to AOS and doesn't matter. AOS tends to be a more combat focused game, a more, I, like, I understand how dominant shooting is in, in, in some metas and things like that. I'm not saying that. But yep. what I'm saying is that it tends to be a closer up game, right? Yep. Even a lot of the shooting is closer range. And uh, you don't, like, whereas in 40k, your basic guns fire out to the long range of weapons often for, uh, you know, for, for an AOS, right? Yeah. So it's a more ranged focus game. It's a game about, you know, dudes with laser guns um, to, to vastly oversimplify. Um, sure. And so having a lot, being that more of the fight is happening at longer range, it makes sense to have a longer range. Unbind. Yeah. Like, I don't feel like that's a change that needs to come. I've never, I felt like 18 inches was always a perfectly good range, actually, in AOS. It's a nice. It's always felt limit. like really close to me. That's like, what it feels I like. About like it. <laughs> but it feels like your casters need to be like up in the thick of things in order to do any unbinding. Yep. That's, I, I, I really enjoy that because okay. it, like, I, to me, it actually presents, given that it is a combat focused game, 
Mm -hmm. um, and I, st I still do think that AOS is primarily a combat-focused game. Yeah. Um, the I, I think that having your casters needing to be somewhat nearer the action presents an interesting set of choices of, yeah. like, do you want to hang back where it's more safe, but where you will be likely out of range for, you know, some of your offensive power, right? Sure. Or you may have units run out of your range you need to then cast on. And you need to sort of think ahead about where units are going to end up after their move, after their charge, right, mm -hmm. for your next hero phase. And that's there's sort of an interesting uh, element to that, that you really have to be thinking ahead about your hero phases that I like because of that shorter range. And where are the enemy casters going to end up, et cetera, right? Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that. I mean, the only pushback is that it just feels like, so the events that I've been in, suddenly... Like people have been like, oh, I get to unbind that, don't I? Like because there's sure. this because you, it, unbinding just happens so infrequently. Sure, that's um, fair. And th that that seems like a problem if like you're just forgetting that you actually get to unbind spells because casters normally aren't within range. Right. No, that's a fair point. I, I won't disagree with that. Um, so I'll say on this one, I'm pretty neutral. I don't care if it comes in. Cool. If not. Well, so cool. What would you think about just a set like wizard level? You know, returning back to eighth edition fantasy. There's a there's a wizard level that you had, and that determined how many spells you had. What if we like that's equivalent of their mastery value of like three? You where do they get oh, three sure. spells to cast and unbind? I like mean, if they I don't simplified have... those pro profiles. So let me say this: yeah. I have no problem with this. So talking about the the number thing, right? Yes. Like the mastery thing that yep. sets your number of casts and dispels. I have yep. no problem with just making what's already there in the game a number, right? Because, like, yes. it's already the thing. It's already a thing, right? Like, now I just have to read a paragraph of text to figure out what the answer is, right? Um, sure. Whereas if I, if, I put the, if I codify it into a number, you know, you've got to be careful with too much of that. It's one of those things that seems really good at first for experienced players, but then if you're a new player and all it says is mastery two, you have I have to, to read something is. else. Go figure that out. I just created another barrier of entry to a new player, right? Yeah. Whereas if it specifically says the text, this this model may cast and unbind two spells, blah, 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 blah. I don't need to read anything else but what's right in front of me, right? Yeah. And there is a value to that. So, you know, yeah. if it, as long as we didn't go too far, with starting to try to make everything fit in its little sure. number thing and hide sure. everything to a separate rules reference. Because once you start labeling and creating yeah. sort of the keywords or the, the ability names for everything, it you're just blowing the barrier of entry out of the water. Yeah, and I mean, I would agree with that. The flip side is that it solves the problem of the Arachnorok. And what <laughs> okay. I mean by... Well, that sounds silly, but like what I mean by that is this. Um, I had a conversation with one of the most uh, experienced Spider Fang players <laughs> that I sure. know, um, and I point. They made a comment about you know casting a spell, and I pointed out, well, you know that they get two. They get to cast two spells, but they only unbind once per turn. Okay. And he goes, "What? Huh?" And like he just assumed that they were the same. Ah, uh, sure. Um, yeah, okay. And like, and so this solves that because it's a set value. Like, there's no discordant. Like, because those are the exception. Normally, it's the same. Normally, it's one and one, two and two. Right. But when it's not, that's not like it's. You have to like that's a piece of information that you actually have to remember. Now, part of that is just knowing your army. I totally get that. Um, and I I happen to know it that this is one of those like disjunctive instances. And so a set number with set stuff would just simplify that. Is what I would say when that does occur. Right. Um, and uh, Yeah, that's fair. But it also, like, flip side to that, very quick flip side, it does yep. put it in a box to where you can't split them if you wanted sure. to. No, it's true. You know, if you sure. wanted to have a glass cannon caster who could just, like, channel tons of magic but had, like, zero ability to dispel, suddenly I can't split that apart anymore without Wait. without tacking on extra rules, right? Saying, sure. like, sure. three... But this this level of mastery only applies to casting, not to unbinding. And so then I like I have to start doing these rule backflips, right? That I right. never had. Yeah, to do it would be a three, but experience. they may not unbind a spell. Something like right. that. Yeah. And it's again, I understand it's not the end of the world, but the point is this kind of little detritus builds up, right, in a rule set. 
sure. it's easy to look at any one in the void and go, oh, but that's simple. Yes, but a thousand simple things become a really complex thing. No, that's true. Okay, yep. a watch is just a, a, a fine Swiss watch. It's just a bunch of simple gears, but I challenge you to build one from scratch, right? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, that's all I'm saying. Um, yep. Okay, uh, the last one you mentioned, critical failures. Oh yes. man, this is the one I will not grognard on. I'm all about this. Sure, <laughs> let's get some heads blowing up again, man. Like I knew days. as soon as I read that, I'm like, well, Vince is in for this one. This is a non-discussion. Yeah. Yes, like obviously in 40k, it's critical because uh, you know all magic comes from the warp, and when you tap into the warp, it blah 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 blah. blah. That's um, how it used, the winds of magic used to be like that too. Sure, I understand. I'm not sure that that's effectively the case in the mortal realms. Like, yeah. I'm not sure the narrative works like that. There's lots of sources of magic, and the winds of magic aren't necessarily from chaos. They're kind of their own thing now. Yeah. Right? They were, that they've caught, they've sort of manifested in, into these mortal realms. So theoretically, yes. they can just draw power from the realms, um, or from Sigmar himself, or whatever. Which raises some really interesting questions. Let me just point that out. Sure. Are, like, are they now in the winds of magic? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the point being, because there's two separate sources, yes. I, I'm digging for 40k. If they want to flip the script and bring it back into AOS, sure, I'm I'm supportive of it. Just because, like, I, I'll agree narratively, it's out of nowhere, but fun wise, I, okay, sounds awesome. Let's blow some heads up. Like, obviously, right now, the only place it exists is what the uh, weird knob shaman, because he's the one who can have back or he can have feedback, right? Yeah, but it's just not the same. No, I understand. I'd, yeah, give me a chart. I know that we hate charts. Give me a chart. No, here's, you don't need a chart. It's an it's optional easy. roll. Hey, sure. Okay, fine. There you go. Optional rule. When you roll snake eyes, this bad thing happens. There you go. Done and done. Call it a day. Yeah. Easy peasy. <laughs> roll another D6. Cool. Right. Yeah, just roll another <laughs> D6, and there's a series of bad things. Yeah. Cool, man. Uh, or or just if you want to keep it hyper simple, you you know, you take some wounds. Or you, do or you roll another D6. Take that many mortal wounds. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Or you and all people in D six, you and all you and all other models in dice range take dice wounds. Right. <laughs> Drop a, nice, a six. Boom. Yeah, boom. Nice little explosion. Sure. Just leaves a smoking crater on the ground. Like that's that's a fairly simple rule that I, I'll agree adds complexity. I know it does, but man, it's cool. Uh, like, uh, <laughs> I do love spellcasters blowing their heads up. I, I can imagine, like, Zinch, like, running a Zinch wizard in and being like, double ones on the casting sure. dice. Just well, purposely, <laughs> purposely doing it to, to bomb. Yeah, sure. Uh, it'd be amazing. Um, All right. Okay. Uh, the next stuff. The next stuff is uh, movement phase. Um, it really wasn't different from what we've had revealed. A movement phase seems very straightforward. Uh, flyers fly. They have the. They did say that the flyers have rules of what their flying is on the chart, and so they may be differentiating the different types of flies, like hovers or or something like that, in the actual forty k scrolls. We don't know yet, um, but everything else seemed the same. Yeah, and they also commented that there'll be large. Like again, I don't want to get into speculation, but they yeah. did comment directly that there'll be like very large speed differentials on some of these like massive flyers, the, the bombers and stuff that are meant to be sort of cruising over the battlefield and not like coming to a stop and getting into stuff as regularly. So I, I imagine we'll see giant, you know, huge fly speed and stuff like that, which is fine. 38 inch range. Yeah, Woo! sure. Like whatever. Just, yeah. Okay. I mean, it's, <laughs> if it's some crazy fighter, it's moving at like, you know, a very, very fast speed compared to how an infantry is walking. I'm cool with it. That's ridiculous. Sure. Uh, but nothing to import there. For the most part, they've got all the same stuff going on. You know, retreating and running, which is called advancing, but it's, it's running. And, yes. You know, yeah. And disengaging, which is called retreating. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's yes. called dis disengaging. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. But yes, they have retreating and running just with different names. Yep. Um, but moving on to the shooting phase, though. Dun, yeah. dun, dun. Big changes here. And this has been the point of so much discussion, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so walk us through it. So the big thing is that there's in the new 40K, there is no shooting into or out of melee. There are some exceptions to this, but in general, that's kind of the rule of thumb. Um, obviously, no shooting if you retreat or no shooting if you run. Um, you can't shoot, so the the more the nitty-gritty is, you can't shoot if there's an enemy model within one inch. Now, 
I don't know if they said if the unit can't shoot or the model can't shoot. And that's the other thing that, um, that wasn't clear from their summaries. Because if I had like a, a unit of like 40 dudes, is it only the front ranks that can't shoot? Or is it the whole unit of 40? Um, and that wasn't clarified in, in, the, um, in the FAQ. But anyways, um, the can't shoot with if there's an enemy within one inch. Uh, pistols still can, though. But pistols have to shoot at the closest enemy target. Um, and then heavy weapons are going to get a neg one modifier if they moved. Uh, regarding ranged attacks, characters can't be targeted if they are the closest model. They can only be targeted by ranged attacks if they're clo the closest model. So right. characters have this kind of implicit ability to hide in nearby units or to blend in is the, kind of the idea, it seems. Um, Small clarification on that, just to make sure we're yes. clear, because somebody will call us out on it. Yeah. Characters with less than 10 wounds. Oh, is it? Was that it? I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. So, like, if you're a giant monstrous character, you're some massive, like the the Tyranid Hive Lord or whatever it's called, right? <laughs> it's like a sure. looming monstrosity on the battlefield. Yeah. Um, that thing can still be shot at because you can see that thing from ten miles away, right? Yeah. In AOS um, terms, if it was to portal, it would be like non-monster heroes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yep. Yep. Um, and then. Uh, yeah, because they made the the key there being they made the point that Rabute Gulaman or whatever, who is a nine wound guy, can actually like even though he's this hulking, you know, dude, yep. he's just he's so much bigger than regular space marines. But despite that, he can walk amongst regular space marines and be relatively protected. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so so let's break this down. Let's one get right one. into the most most controversial one right out of the gate. The yep. thing that people have been yelling about, right? Yep. Which is the shooting into and out of combat, right? Yep. Um, now, obviously, there is the pistol exception, 40K, which I... I don't know how you would communicate that into AOS. Right. There's That's not codified in the same way where weapons have types. Yes, there are things called pistols in, uh, you know, in AOS, but there's plenty of other small hand-based, trigger-based weapons that aren't that don't have pistol in their name, right? And so, like, it's not a type. There's no... Type like throwing order. axes. Sure, yeah, great example. <laughs> yeah, like... Okay. Um, so it's harder to just slap a categorical rule on there in that way, right? And say... Weapons these can range still less shoot. than X. Sure, like, that would... You might be able to pull on something like that. Um, you know, this has been one that a lot of people have said they... Like, well, I don't know a lot. There's been a lot of chatter on the internet about it. And how many, what that actually translates to on the player base is obviously easy to overread, right? Yes. Because the squeaky wheel gets the grease or replaced, depending on how you want to read that, that little idiom. But um, it's certainly a popular thing to talk about, but I don't know how much of it represents. So I'm not going to say I think it's overwhelming that people want this or it's a minority. I don't know. I have no exception. I haven't done any statistics. So what analysis. do you think about it? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think. <laughs> Uh, I no, I don't want to see it. Like, um, I, I'll fall back on the so fact. So let that me get this. So, so <laughs> those big siege machines in the back get engaged in melee combat, and they're like, "Fire away!" Yeah, yeah, sure, okay. absolutely. Keep loading them guns. We've only got a few seconds left. Kill the important target. Bring that thing down. That's heroic. In the face of people murdering them, they still load the cannon and get one more brave shot. Yeah, you bet your, you bet your bottom dollar, man. I dig that image. I really do. And but they're not, you know, you know, like, as far as, like, well, why are these handgunners turning their handguns on somebody 20 inches away when there's somebody murdering them in their face? Because they are. I don't know. Because that's what you told them to do. That's what their commander told them to do, assumingly represented by, you know, who's voicing your will. Um, because they're not actually sentient things who are making decisions. They're soldiers following some kind of order, um, you know, or, or that's what they prioritize to be the more frightening thing. They thought they could handle these other guys. Like, I, I get it. The argument is one from, from quote unquote realism. Yeah. Versimilitude. But at the same time, like, yeah, I don't think it's versimilitude. Okay. okay? I, yeah. I don't. Versimilitude means do the rules make sense within the world that it inhabits? Okay, sure. and I think labeling this as verisimilitude is false. This is a crazy, ridiculous world of weird magic, and where shooting weapons can be all sorts of different nonsense. 
we're, yeah. we're far outside of the world of longbows and, 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 you know, crossbows and, and even handguns. Yes, those are still around. Yes, troops still have them. But there's also weird, magical arbalests that fire and mortal arrows of Zinch and turn off hunter bows, whatever the heck those things are. Little quiverlings that's handing them arrows. Assumingly out of their own guts from the way the model's put together. Um, <laughs> so, like, my point is, I don't know how a lot of these shooting weapons work, right? Like, a lot of these things are clearly magical or strange or different or don't have a real-world parallel. I'll agree or that it's funny, Storm too. fiends with little rat brains. Yeah, like, exactly. Storm fiends with little rat brains. Shooting magical... Like Squato, yeah. Yeah, shooting magical globes full of poison magic gas out of a weird arcing device. Like, I don't know, man. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know how that thing works. I've never seen one. Um, and I would, I would doubt anyone else has either. Um, so like to me, I get the realism. Part. I get yep. it. Yep. Um, and I'm not saying it's bonk or it's nonsense. I'm saying that in the context of this game, it doesn't feel necessary. I like that you get to make a tactical decision about where your shooting goes. Most shooting units are such crap in yeah. melee that they die pretty fast. Like, Empire handgunners, once you get them in melee, those dudes are just dead. Yeah. They're just dead. If you hit them with anything that has any kind of punch, they just fold and explode. Um, so, like, I feel like you're already penalized enough in melee. I needing to shoot... And, and by the way, oftentimes people do fire into the unit that's, <laughs> that's attacking them, right? Um, it's not like as though people always go off and target other units. Sure. I've seen many people fire into the unit that's attacking. Um, it's sometimes with many shooting units, it's the only way they're going to not get wiped out is to hope their shooting is good enough to hit the unit they're in melee with. Um, so I like I know all the good arguments about it, but to me, I just think it's my answer is I'm going to come down to it's more fun and allows a larger, varied set of armies if you allow shooting to keep working the way it does. Sure. Um, I think that there are just armies built around you know, shooting being functional in melee. And the second you take that away, even if you restricted it down to like, okay, shooting could still work in melee, the, the sub-argument here would be don't take the exact 40k rule. The yeah, same and just let shoot them shoot shots. whoever they're engaged with. Right. I'm, I'm softer on that rule. Like, I do yeah. get that, because that still has somewhat of the appeal to realism. It doesn't then completely neuter that unit. Yeah. Right? Um, like, just turning off their guns, I just, I hate. Yeah, um, I agree with that. Um, but, the the advantage of doing something like this, though, would make like mobility and engagement, and being able to have like units engage other units to hold them up so that they can't shoot into you know like there would be advantages to having those uh, extra little skirmisher units that just don't right. exist now. Sure, I, I agreed. I'm totally agreed with that. Like it would have a huge amount of consequences. Most people, when they argue this, they just argue about the realism of it and don't go anywhere. Sure, sure, right? sure. To me, this is has more second and third order consequences. It would change the way armies are constructed. It would yep. change, like, not just the units you take. I mean, like, the nature of army construction. Yeah, right? you, would ha you would have to have another type of unit that we're not currently f being forced to field right now, which is the engagement unit to shut other range units down or to slow right. them down. Which I'm not saying is good or bad. I'm just saying it is. I'm not making a normative judgment. Oh, I think it is. Like I like, and what I mean is, like, I think that uh, I think it would mix things up fairly significantly. I think there would be a benefit to that. I'd prefer that if p units would have to be it like shoot into the units that they're engaged with. And so some of those siege weapons that I was really like banging on about that you know like uh, have minimum range of like six inches. And so if they get engaged in melee. Like they're they do not, just shut off. They do just shut off, right? Yeah, sure. And so I think that there may be some value to that. Um, but let's move on. Um, well, real quick. So let yeah. me sum up my point of view. I don't want to see the 40K rule imported here wholesale. Okay. If it was imported as I can only shoot the unit I'm engaged with, I'd be like, okay, that's fine. I, I get it. So I, I would. this would be like a compromise one for me. I wouldn't take a hard line. Fair? Sure. Yep. Yep. Um, and what I would say, so the other one that I want to uh, hit on is um not the sure characters. uh no the so heavy weapons had a neg one hit modifier if they moved yeah again i, I don't think there's a way you can import that because i don't know what a heavy weapon means unless we're okay. gonna go back so, and like so relabel let me, everything let me let me push this a different direction 
Okay. What are your thoughts if a unit moves more than eight inches, it gets an egg one to hit? I, I, I don't like it. Why is that a thing? Because be, because of the mobility issue, like shooting on the run is basically what's happening. Sure. Okay. Well, like, you know, sky fires are dudes on floaty discs that auto stabilize. Like it seems like they can, that's not, that's half their move. It seems like they could move that and still shoot effectively. Um, you know, I, I don't know what a unit's capable of doing. And, and my point is like a blanket rule like that doesn't heed that individual unit's uniqueness or sure. its ability to do those things. I, I just don't see it. It's, it's rules weight that doesn't need to be there. It isn't doing anything. If sure. you want that to be, if you want to capture that, put that on a scroll, right? Have that yes. be, if this unit moves X far, they hit on blah instead of blah, whatever. Yes, I mean, I guess... way we do it in the reverse direction now. Yeah, I mean, I guess the pushback is just, it limits one of the less fun, which is like the kiting ranged, um, like like skirmishy stay out of, out of combat shootiness um, of, you know, like the un, one of the unfun play styles is what I would say. Sure. I mean, the only people who are really doing that are Skyfires, I think, because they have that absolutely ridiculous movement. And the fact um, is, we all know they're going to get kneecapped. Yeah, sure, sure. They're going to take a points hit, probably. But, yeah. um, like, there are some Wanderers armies that are floating around. But in general, you're right. It's mostly Skyfires at this point. Okay. Yeah, and so, then like, finally... just adjust their points and <clears throat> problem yeah. solved. So and my point is, by the way, this already exists in particular war schools. Things like handgunners don't get their plus one to hit if they move. Or whatever, right? Like sure. so, that's already there. Okay, just there in reverse. Yep. So, what about characters um, being targeted if they're not the closest model from range attacks? If let's say, if like non non monster heroes. Sure. Yeah, or non non. Uh, yeah, basically anybody who doesn't have have monsters. Sure. Um. I love I, it. I, 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 need, I, oh, yeah. I need to formulate on this. Go ahead. Yeah. How often do your characters get sniped? Uh, they don't because I'm forced to keep them a hundred miles from combat. I'm forced <laughs> to like, and well, no, because, because they are so vulnerable and so essential to my force, what it forces me to do is to snake a line of 18 chaos warriors back to the back edge of my table so that they still get all their buffs without my characters actually being anywhere near combat. I would willingly move them up towards combat if I knew that they wouldn't get easily sniped. All right, well, I'm of two minds on this one. Sure. Okay. Um, understanding that the normal army that I face yep. is an empire porcupine <laughs> that has sure. five cannonballs coming out of it every turn, all with an engineer yep. and a hurricanum, so that everything is hitting on re-rollable threes. Right. Okay? Now, in um, this instance, you would still be able to pick out the hurricanum because it would probably be either non-monster or non-behemoth. Like that, sure, like that, sure. that would probably be that. Yeah. So you could yeah. pick out one, but the engineer would probably still be safe. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying what I'm staring down. Okay, if anybody yeah, has a right yeah. to be angry about characters getting sniped, I feel like I've got at least a play to it. <laughs> sure. Okay. Sure. The average game I look at, that number of cannonballs, the engineer himself has a sniper rifle. Yeah. Uh, the Huracanum has all sorts of weird, shooty, mortal, auto mortal wound stuff. And then there are probably somewhere between 40 and 60 handguns. Yeah. Okay. So like it's just I'm I'm staring at a porcupine bumping times in my game. Yeah. Um and not to mention the fact that other players have like I I regularly play with people who use tons of chuckas and stuff like that. So um character attacking is yeah. certainly a thing. Uh and it's never really bothered me. Maybe I'm just tolerant to it. I don't know. I you know, well, like if, oftentimes let me say two things. One yeah. Oftentimes, they're not shooting at those characters because there are more preeminent threats that are a lot closer to their lines. Um, like, stuff is coming, and they got to deal with that, right? The, yeah. the big hammer unit is coming, and if they don't thin that out, they're going to die. Yeah. Uh, the five-wound character might be an easy kill, but that's shots that could have gone to killing the unit that's about to kill you. Sure, but okay. what I my pushback would be something like this. What this does is this protects the war boss and the cunning rocks. This protects the necromancer for the flesh eater courts and you know, like those kind of key pieces that, that are essential to their combat effectiveness. Yeah, I guess. I don't know that I like that. Um 
I, this is why I say I'm of two minds. Like, I'll yeah. openly admit I'm a flip flopper on this one. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Because I can see the unfun of like somebody starting the game and just and just staring down a, a bunch of guns and having their characters just <laughs> picked off the table. And it's like, well, hope you didn't want to use those guys because they're all dead now. <laughs> right. And that's really garbage. Like, I get that. That is, that's booty. Okay. And I'm not going to say it's not. Um, but at the same time, I put myself in the other position where I have like, where if it's not like gun line against melee force, you know, yeah. some weird like opposition like that. Yep. And, uh, I put myself as like, we both have some mixed forces and I'm staring down something like the common ruck or, or a sale, the faithless over there or whatever. Yep. Yep. And I know well, that's the flip I, side of this sale is protected in this world. Sale becomes immortal. The blood secretor becomes immortal. All of these pieces that are critical yeah. to these like really powerful combos just become immortal. Yeah. Um, because they can put themselves in positions where there is never, they're never going to be the closest person yeah. to the shooting. Yeah, because you can you can plant them in the middle of a unit. They're not right. joining that unit, but they they are they will never be the closest model. Yeah, you just snake the unit around them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and then suddenly like you can easily maintain cohesion and have that person in the middle. Yep. Um, I do that all the time. Oh, yeah, absolutely. All the time. <laughs> sure. um, you know, I do it so people just can't get charged, right? So my characters can't get charged if I don't want them to, and then they can pile in. That's just, yeah, sure, tactics of the game. Yeah. Um, but, like, suddenly those pieces become impossible for me to remove. And, and I'll, I'll point out, by the way, that we already did get um, – we did get – uh, things and rules spoiled. Uh, let me push 40K. back on that. Let me push back okay. on that. Uh, with range attacks, you couldn't remove the range. You could still remove the magic. with range attacks. Uh, fair enough. Sure. 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 Okay. Yeah. That's that is a good and fair pushback. I, I accept it totally. You could still be arcane bolting them or something. Yep. Sure. Um. So I will say on the flip side as well. By the way, we did already see spoilers that there are units that will break this rule. Sure. Sure. Right? That's nice. Um, yeah. Yeah, they gave like the rattlings, which are basically like forty k halflings. Um, the rattling snipers, one of my favorite old units from from the Imperial Guard or Astro Militarum, whatever you want to call them. Um, I loved my little my little halfling snipers, and the halfling snipers can can pick out characters and kill them, which is that amazing. Makes those like that's a neat. Scary. Yeah, that, like that's a neat. Yeah. Like imagine Giselles with that rule. Sure. So what I'll say is, if yeah. you're willing to rewrite the War Scrolls yeah. to give that ability out, and by the way, it's going to have to be pretty darn widely available, okay? Because that's the problem. Once you introduce this, if you don't make that rule pretty widely available, and I don't mean like everybody has it, I mean like most al most alliances and certainly even most popular holistic sub-factions would need access to a unit with it. Yeah. My problem is, one, doesn't that unit just become auto tape? Two, don't the units without it uh, in an AOS world become so, auto lose against those combos, right? If I can't kill the Blood Sprayer or Sail or could, whatever. You could bake it into like character traits or you could bake it into items or things like that as well. You're going to have to, that's my point, you're going to have to really splash it around. Because yeah. otherwise, the only way you're stopping that blood letter bomb is by eating it in the face, losing a couple units, and grinding it down. And that is it. Or hope you can arc well, it. Or hope shoot, you brought enough spell cast. Shoot the blood, blood secreter. Shoot the blood letters off the table. Well, you better be able to do that at the top of one. Uh, because they're coming right now. They're here. Look at that. They were on the other side of the table. Now they're well, here. There's some Karajan overlords with an answer to that. Sure. <laughs> um, well, and, and so a lot of chaos like ability to, to yeah. pick out choice targets and go away with this. Yep. So again, I'm I'm just really torn on this one. Like I get the upsides, I get the downsides. Uh, in the end, it's this one is not an easy one, and I think you make this change or something like this. Yeah, you are going to introduce a lot of bad. You know, I've talked a lot before. You and I both talked about how no rules change is free. Yep. Every rules change has both good and bad. Yep. And I'm really torn on this one as being like straight 50-50. Right? Like, I feel like you're just flipping the coin to the other side with this one. You're going to introduce a whole host of new challenges. 
of unbreakable synergistic combos outside of like caster spamming. So does caster spam now become a thing? Like you have to bring tons of casters so you can use your magic to snipe critical sure. characters sure. as opposed to like before you really didn't need them. You know, like the weird second and third order moves that happen in the meta here would be massive off of this one, bigger than even the last thing, right? Oh, so. and I agree with that. Um, I think it's just it's something to think about. So let's let's move to our final kind of conversation, which yep. is charges. So there's a big change in the charging phase that I think we need to pay attention to and talk about, um, and that is that um, units that charge activate first in combat so period. before period so before the alternation happens if i charge with a unit that unit always swings first in that first combat that they've charged in right yep um what do you think uh i don't like it um because i think it there's an interesting choice point you're making right now even during your own turn and charging it's not all upside right like if you you're can incentivized charge. To, to charge with one or three units right sure sure or to charge with two and take the fact that like you're gonna need to think about what that second unit is charging right like yes. can it absorb the attack yes yeah from what it's yeah. going into so there's an interesting set of decisions that get made there right um that i think evaporate like that whole conception just that's removed yeah. from it's the always advantage it's you're always advantage to charge because yep. you take away the charge from the other player, and you always get to attack first. Yeah. And, you know, certainly as somebody who plays from a fair amount of, like, uh, Bretonian knights or something on, on table on occasion. Sure. Hey, I love the idea of all my knights getting to slam first with their bonuses. Um, but to me, I, I feel like this is one I, I wouldn't want to see. Um, I love the sort of mental game of thinking about your charges and how they're all going to interact. It's one of my favorite parts of the game of picking the alternating units. And turning that to a flip upside of like everybody charging gets to go first, where it's just like just shove it across the table and it's you're fine, you're gonna be able to go first in all those combats. Just take something that's a really interesting back and forth and makes it boring for me. Yeah, I don't know. I like it. Um, just simply because right now, like I think about those very fragile units, you mm -hmm. know, that like pop out, so like your spoiler, um, high damage, low defense, like can't take a hit, but so I think about like um, the Endrin Riggers, for example, or the Sky Wardens, if you had a melee unit you know, Sky Wardens from KO. I've been thinking a lot about this. And like, I'm not ever going to run two of those units into combat in the same turn, ever. Right. Like, I just can't, because one well, will never you're swing. Well, unless you're setting a second unit into like nothing, right? right? But, into well, some yeah. ridiculous. Well, it's, just, like, it's just never going to swing. Right. Because what's right. going to happen is, is like, if there are two wounds, four up save, and stuff's going to turn around and delete them. And sure. so, like, I, so, like, it's actually, like, the way that charging works changes my entire list right now. Because, like, I'm just completely de-incentivized to do that for any, like, I think about, like, Goblin Fanatics, for example, um, are, are very similar in this. Like, that's why they're only being, like, Goblin Fanatics are almost never used offensively. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. Yeah, they're, they're defensive exclusive. charge. They're, yeah, the they're charge, charge blocks. So they're not actually what you would kind of expect them to be. They are wrecking balls, but they're never like they're not the actual like not doing that thing of hitting stuff. That's not. I would purpose. push back on that slightly. Historically, they were always charge blockers. By the way, um, now units got to continue their charge historically, but like they always hit in units and they always popped on the charge and they always smashed units on the charge and acted as big problems to enemy charging units. Sure. Like, like, yeah, and then and then after that, they were almost worthless. But they now, even as charge blockers, like they're not going to do anything. Like, even in this world, they wouldn't do anything because they're not, because, well, actually, they might because both would be charging, technically. Yeah, um, I don't know. Yeah. yeah I don't know um, but but it, this, like, a rule like this would create an interesting situation for, like, the corn units that charge off turn and the enemy sure. hero phase and stuff like that. Like, so it would create this really interesting incentive for some of our melee units, is what I would say. Right. Um, no, I'm, I'm with that. So, I don't know. Uh, I, I think it could be neat. I would be open to it. Uh, but I agree that there are a number of, um, you know, second order changes. Like, it, the incentive structure completely evaporates. You know, you always want to get the charge. That's always the right answer. Yeah, it would just uh, be like, if you're yeah. not, if you ain't charging, you ain't playing, right? And, and I don't, I, I'm going to come down, I, I, I'm going to come down hard on this one. I, I think even as we've talked, I've solidified my opinion more. Like, I thought about this one a lot beforehand. Yeah, and I was I was pretty much like seventy five twenty five against. I'm gonna come down hard against it. 
I don't like it. I don't want to see it. I want I want my mini game of needing to tactically think about how I charge to play smart. Yeah. Like I have to play smart. I want that to remain. I like being forced to think about my game some while I'm playing. Well, yeah. I play hey, don't get me wrong. I play a defensive army and this would neuter me. This would be ridiculously hard on me. Because right, right now I play a unbreakable line army and I just shove my stuff forward and I don't care about the charge. Whether I'm, you know, like whether you charge me or I charge you, right now it doesn't matter because you're going to activate with one unit and then I'm going to swing back with like 60 attacks. Um, right. But then, if in this other world, if I don't get that charge off, then you can come in with eight different units and swing everything on me before I swing once. Right. Yeah. And that's, I, um, I just, I, I'm yeah. very against that. Sure. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, the only other just quick mention, they mentioned yeah. like the heroic intervention thing that heroes... Which we don't know what that is. Which we don't know what it is. That's why we're not commenting on it. It's there. Heroes can somehow like jump into combats that are happening near them. We don't know. Does that mean just like current AOS? It's heroes, probably a... Get, I'm guessing Timfoil had... It's probably a, like a six-inch pile-in. There's a combat sure. going on within six inches. They can probably pile in. Sure. They just have kind of a natural longer pile-in in those situations. Yes. Probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, to me, it's not necessary. I've always... The, the normal way that the three-inch combat bubble exists and how other units get pulled in, yeah. fine, thumbs up. It's all good. It makes people think very carefully about how they arrange their troops, how you charge, what angles you're doing at. Yep. It does... I, I love the way that the, that interacts right now. How sure. units can kind of get swept into combat is, is pretty fantastic. One of my most favorite things. Um, yeah, so there you go. I think that's most of what we know right now, right? Yep. yep. Most of the big ones. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's it for our show today. Yeah, quick one today. Like I said, I apologize. We normally, but this one's quicker. Uh, we hope we covered everything, at least in brief. Obviously, we want to know your opinions. Are we full of crap? What of these rules changes do we you are. want to see brought in? Well, we, are. we definitely are. Yeah, yeah. 100% we are. Um, we don't know what we're talking about. We're just two idiots on the internet. But that being said, we want to know what you think. So drop it down in the comments uh, as to what of these rule changes, if any, you would like to see brought into AOS and why or why not. Uh, because I think it's an interesting discussion. Uh, so let me, we'll just end on this final question. Here, here we go, Tom. I'll ask you this in a very gener general, generic way. Are any of these coming into AOS? Yes or no? Don't, you don't have to tell me which ones. Just a a everything we've covered is something, prediction time, is something we've covered coming into AOS. Yes. All right. I will also say yes. Yeah, I agree. Like, I don't know what. I don't think it'll be much, but I do think some is definitely coming. Like, we're seeing changes on the horizon. Yeah. Agreed. All right. Cool. There we go. Well, as always, Tom, thank you. Right back week, or next week, we'll be back. I'll be back at home. Normal show. We'll be talking uh, Age of Sigmar skirmish. Uh, but uh, to all of you who are watching, thank you very much. We deeply appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed it. And as always, we'll see you next Wednesday.